welcome for another Café Rollist. I am joined by the second half, is that correct, of Did and D&D, &D, or are you Did and D&D &D and Kat is just uh, someone who jumped into the passenger seat? <laughs> no, because like the, the channel, the Geek Dogs and D&D, &D, DID, is just me. Um, and when I was saying, Kat was asking me questions about what it's like to to have multiple personalities. And I was like, well, you're a GM. I was like, so just imagine when you're in a setting where you have to, sorry, my dog's scratching on the bed. So, imagine a setting where you have to like, you've got like five NPCs and you can imagine how they would react to stuff. I was like, so it's basically just like I live with a D&D &D party in my head all the time. And she's like, oh, we could totally do a thing. And like, you could actually bring them to life. We can make characters for all of your altars. And she got really excited. I was like, that can be a thing. And then, did and D&D came about so we're definitely like two halves of the same thing but my half is just further split I guess than hers because she's one person and I'm a few. So could you introduce yourself actually because yeah I should have encouraged you to do that first. Ah it's no problem so I am Danny. Um, I am the host of the Chaos Collective which is kind of what we call ourselves as like a whole um, but on the most part I just go by Danny. Um, I openly live with dissociative identity disorder, which used to be known as multiple personality disorder. It is nothing like the movie Split. I have absolutely no desire to kidnap people and murder them. Like, it's just not a thing. Um, while, I, while I do, and I don't have did, so you see. <laughs> exactly. Like, you know, the people without it are the ones you have to watch. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I've got two eyes breaking questions. Uh, the first okay. one is, in this time of COVID-19, what is your routine like? Has it changed or not? It's not changed too much. Um, I work from home anyway. Um, I work as a clinical animal behaviorist, so I do consults with people that have problems with their pets, mostly dogs. So a lot of it is at home. I then go and visit clients and then come back home. So it's just the visiting clients part that I don't do anymore, but I video call them instead. So my day-to-day -day hasn't changed hugely other than the fact that I have a seven-year-old 24 hours a day. Well, um, that can change things quite a bit. At least it did that's, for, that's for me. That's the biggest thing. Yeah, is like any parents out there, you know, we love our children dearly. But there's a reason why we have a school. You know, <laughs> teachers exist for a reason. Parents exist for a reason. You know, you have parents that are full-time parents and part-time parents because you can't parent and teach at the same time as well as working like it, it's an impossible task so now everyone's kind of got to work and parent and be a teacher and it's just it's... so that's the biggest change I would say um, a lot of my friends we used to video call regularly anyway if we weren't meeting up at the club so I miss the social aspect of hugging people but it's the it's the parenting side that's the biggest change for me, which I assume you'll probably understand. Yeah, uh, mine is two years old, and I mean, yeah, clearly, uh, childcare is a proper it's a proper job. I, I'm, I mean, uh, which I'm just barely trying to, to I'm I'm trying to manage and to with of course with the help of my wife, but she's working from home, so. She's less available. Right. Uh, I think I'm getting better at it. But yeah, when I was saying it's a proper job, I mean, I try to manage uh, while the great professionals at this nursery, uh, they yeah, they they did a lot of things which uh, I don't I I I'm don't feel cap capable of doing. I think it, it's gonna have a, a lot of catch up in terms of uh, education, training in a number of things and. Uh, yeah, we do things with Amy. It certainly goes more into parks and and so on. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's a it's a mix of things. Uh, it's it's so difficult. Yeah, um, I was talking to a friend of mine who, like yourself, she has she has toddlers, and I'm like, I couldn't imagine what it would be like to be 24 hours stuck inside with a toddler because when my little one is a toddler. We could go to the parks, we could go to play centres, we could burn off that excess energy. And like, you, you guys can't now. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm really glad he's seven because I can give him like his Nintendo Switch or any other console of choice. And he can go off and play a game for a little bit. So I get a little bit of a breather and some me time back. 
but I mean toddlers, they're like 24 hours a day because they, does your sleep, do they at least sleep? Well, the, the, the point of this show, well, the reason it's at 2 p.m. in the afternoon is because that's the moment when we put him for his nap. So yeah. so he's sort of sleeping now. What what he's been doing for a couple of weeks now is he he doesn't fall asleep as much at two PM after his bottle of milk, but mm -hmm. he doesn't complain being put in his bed. So oh, so okay. so he's okay, he hangs out there and usually after a little while he, he falls asleep. In the meantime we can hear him uh giggle and oh, have fun doing stuff. So. Usually, yeah, usually when we found him asleep he is in his bed, <laughs> sprawled with uh, excursions and teddy bears thrown out of the bed. But uh, yeah, <laughs> I guess he throws everything out and then he gets bored and, and then he falls asleep. But, falls asleep. Uh, but it's uh, very tough. In, yeah, the, the toughest I find is the in the evening because you, you, you take care of him all day. And oh. I mean, it's it's OK, but it's it's quite demanding. But. Uh, in oh God, the evening, yeah. he's very overexcited and very noisy, and that's kind of the moment when you are at the end of your rope. And uh, yeah. I mean, when you work and he's at the nursery, it's not that you come, you don't come back from work full of energy, but because you're more available, because you know it's something mm -hmm. different than what you've been doing the rest of the yeah. day. While, yeah, right now it's yeah, it's like you're you're counting down to bedtime. Yeah, exactly. And then yeah. hoping that they actually stay in bed because it. I think unless you're a parent, you don't know how... Just demanding it is just having to be available yeah. all that time. And then you just end up... You find yourself staying up a little bit. You find yourself staying up really late just so you can have some time on your own. Yeah, that's the thing. We don't we don't have time on our own uh, with Persephilia. We... Yeah, uh, we take turns at taking care of him. And then, and then when it's the evening... Yeah, at best we watch a movie together, but most of the time we, we just need to get each of us in a corner of the room and be, be with with ourselves for for a couple hours. Yeah. Uh, have you picked just adults? Yeah, have you picked anything, any new skill or hobby? Uh, despite your routine not changing so much, but because of the no. the situation. Not really. I mean, a couple of years ago, I got diagnosed with like a chronic illness, so. I kind of had like the, the frustrations of lockdown happen a couple of years ago. Um, so I picked up a new hobby then that I'm just still refining. Um, so I, I got into making things out of polymer clay because I quite enjoy sculpting. I was always really rubbish at it. And I'm one of those people where when I do something, I like to do it and I can critique myself quite harshly. So if I'm doing something I know how to do and I don't do it well, I can beat myself up a little bit about it. So I was like, I'm going to try something completely new and then I can only get better. It's, my it's, and it's, this is my... I'm going to say this is my latest little creation. Cool. Is this polymer is clay what, what's called milliput? Uh, two components and you mash them together it's, or is it something different? It's something different. Um, there are some parts of polymer clay that's very similar. So like milliput is quite like the epoxy stuff that you make together. This is just... It's like a plastic clay that you just mold out of and then you bake it in the oven. Oh, so that's like Fimo, so we say all the brands. Yes. I'm, yeah. I'm trying to remember that from, from back in the days when I was uh, uh, hobby making. Let, give me a second, I'm going to show you something I did. Yeah. So I didn't I didn't do the whole of it, I just did the, the cloud, but I'm still quite proud of it. So wow. I... So th this is a resin cast. So th those were bootlegged in the time because you could not find the actual ones uh, in in Belgium and France. Then the the yeah. they were the fandom was there, but most of the the products were not available. <laughs> I should dust that. And uh, so uh, this is a resin uh, which uh, I painted, and to reproduce the scene, I made the um, what is it called in English? The nuage supersonic, the the magic cloud. Uh, out of milliput yeah. and painted it. I love this little statue. Yeah. But it really needs a good yeah. dusting from up there. Yeah, no, this kind of stuff, because I've got this little guy. I made like a little a little kitsune. And then I made bag end the other day as well as a candle holder. <laughs> oh, wow, that's so cute. Huh? That's so cute. And it's just, 
it's a way to kind of keep you sane. Mm -hmm. um, and I find that the the clay itself is quite grounding for me. Yeah, I'm, and, um, I miss that, but yeah, we cannot do everything. <laughs> no, no. So that's what I started doing, and now I've got more time to do it. So I'm just I'm trying to come up with more extravagant things to do and trying to push myself. And I've got like a collection of dragons that I did about a year ago now that I really want to try because I've got a few other techniques that I've tried and I want to kind of bump up doing some more dragons. Have you ever um, done... I've a lot of mimics that I did. Have you ever done anything you used in, uh, in dungeon crawling then uh, for for D and D game or something similar? Yeah, um, I've made a couple of like little mimic boxes, and we've got a cardboard like diorama up there that myself, and my partner made. That's got like an entire pub scene cool. in it for one of our. Actually, we're doing um, Descent Travenous at the minute um, with a few friends. So one of the pubs um, in Boulder's Gate. We did up there, so there's a few little things that I try and and mix in, but a lot of the stuff I make is too big to fit into minis. So when I make, so some of the monsters, I can do because they're bigger, but I'm not that good at doing really tiny stuff yet. <laughs> yeah, I'll get there. It's tough. Huh? You you need some tools. You you cannot uh, yeah. hand make them. Uh, you mentioned uh, before. Uh, I'm keen to uh, to resume the conversation we're having just before we started the stream. You you were telling me you're you're about to have a go for your first time in uh, Mage, uh, from a Mage in... the Ascension. Yeah, yeah, I'm so excited because I I like World of Darkness as a thing. Anyway, I play quite a bit of Vampire the Masquerade, um, and I've dabbled a little bit in Werewolf. Werewolf is really fun as well, but Mages were always that thing that like I really want to be a Mage. I want to see what it's like to just be able to do anything in the world but it just be really silly things because I wouldn't take over the world or anything and my partner was joking how everything at the minute in 2020 is like a bunch of mages have just gone wrong and they just need to like reset things it certainly um, feels a bit like that <laughs> my memories of mage are patchy I played it only once uh, it was a rather linear one shot but quite good and uh, I yeah. so and we played the same mage through different times but you oh. would you would go so you played them today and I was mm -hmm. kind of a drug addict and uh, each and then we would jump back in time and play the memories yeah. from them because they, they were uh, they, they realized that they were amnesiacs and going oh. backwards <laughs> so I don't remember what was my second incarnation it was probably something like 15th century but yeah, my I oh. at the end I found out that my first incarnation and it's funny because the, the game master did it so that so I started with the character who was the the least you know, had the the least of a leadership role, and as okay. you went back in time, the dynamic of the character so sort of inverted themselves because each time we would be handed a little background they were all all the characters were uh, pre written for us. They were pre-generated. Oh, wow. And in the last incarnation, the group and myself realized, it was nicely foreshadowed, but we, we didn't get the twist before that time, that I was actually Jesus Christ. <laughs> they were the apostle. <laughs> so, That's brilliant. And then we went back to today, which, ah, yeah, it's it's hazy in my yeah. mind. Going back from being Jesus to, to today, like, no wonder your character was a drug addict. <laughs> yeah, I think... Yeah, that mage. I remember I needed or music was helping with my mage, so I would I would actually use. I had a, an iPod or something like that, probably my phone, and I played some yeah. weird ass music to say, yeah, my my character the, is um, dancing. One of the mage types is like um, they are essentially drug addicts, aren't they? They get a lot of the the magic and stuff from taking in other substances. Um, yeah, that was the one. But I don't remember what they called. No, my partner knows. He's been schooling me on Mage for the past year, on and off, and he's finally gone. Okay, I'm just going to get the core rule book, but he really wants to play it as well. And I'm like, I I can't DM very well anyway. I'm like, I'm not going to be able to DM Mage. Like, I don't know enough about it. You'll have to find a friend that can DM it for us if we're going to do it as a game where you play. Um, but hopefully he'll do like a little one shot for us. And I'm kind of hoping that we can get Cat and Kelvin involved. 
Um, because I know as part of Mage, you can have one of their flaws is to have multiple personalities. So I think it'd be quite interesting to play a game that has my disorder as as like a set kind of component for one of the characters to see how well they actually do it. Yeah, interesting. Uh, to be honest, I, I've... I've watched a couple of episodes of your show, but I, I should dive into it a bit, a bit more. Uh, it was interesting. It's just a uh, YouTube format is not the easiest for me in terms of it's difficult for me. Well, back in the days to watch while I was commuting, like, like when I take my son to the park, I can listen to a podcast still today, but watching a video while watching it, that is not running up and down yeah. a tree uh, is difficult. But We uh, have debated of, of transforming it into a podcast as well for people to kind of, listen to um at the minute it's mostly me and cat just discussing life and things and building the characters that we're going to do on the campaign the campaign will be better than what we've got at the minute we need to cut things down because we talk a lot um <laughs> which for some viewers they they enjoy just sitting back with a cup of tea and just listening to us talk about mental health and life and and stuff and other people like just get to the character building like the, so we have a nice mix of the people that are there for the mental health and the people that are just there for the D&D &D. <laughs> and we're, we're trying to help like we can get like a crossover and create like a bit of a safe place for people that have mental illness to kind of go you know what you're fine like just come and play some D&D &D with us especially one of the episodes I did watch was the one uh, when you discussed about your experience at Dragon Meat it was especially yeah. interesting so did you? Yeah, add... we got to meet you there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, sadly, Dragon Meat is. Uh, I really miss Dragon Meat. You, you mentioned hugs. Uh, pff, yeah, the 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 physical friendliness <laughs> is something uh, we've been missing right now. But uh, yeah, yeah. Tell us a bit more about that experience, if you because yeah, my, my interaction with you yeah. was like I think uh, you know it's kind of these experience when you are. It was very brief. Yeah. I think it's like we're passing because it's you're so busy at Dragon Meat anyway. Uh, but when we because Kat loved the morning I think that kind of was one of her favourite parts Is so in the morning like she sent us a me message and was like if you want to come in with me you can come in with me or you can lie in and come in later um, and she sent a message in the morning that got a reply saying yeah we're going to have a lie and we'll meet you there and within minutes like we were up and dressed and she was like you've just messaged me saying you're staying in and like it was one of my ulcers that replied going, I want to have a lie in. And the other one was like, nope, we're getting up. I'm like, <laughs> dressed. <laughs> and she's like, oh, okay, yeah, cool. She's like, so who replied? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't even know why I picked up my phone. <laughs> um, and then, like, as we're going through the day, it's like, it's like different parts of us teleport depending on what's going on. Because um, Loon is my, like... My, is like the most sociable of alters. So most of the time when people meet us out and about in those kinds of places, it's either me or Luna or both of us that you're talking to. And Luna's got a lot higher pitch voice than me. And it's it's an interesting experience because sometimes I'm like, I don't really remember a lot of it. Um, I remember we played a vampire game that was really fun. Uh, Modifius ran that. Um, we met a whole bunch of people. We jumped in on the stream with Anne Julie and did some mini painting. Um, but I can't remember like a lot of the the bits. And then when Kat talks to like Luna or one of my alters, they kind of fill in the gaps. So it's fascinating from her perspective because I'm like, oh, I don't really remember. And then someone else will talk, tell her, oh, we did this and I remember this. And she's like, Danny doesn't remember that. But, so it's a, it's a weird thing to do. But Dragon Meat itself was... It was just so much fun. It's one of the nicest conventions I've ever been to. Because it's just so much friendlier than the ones like Comic-Con and some of your bigger ones. Like, everyone is really friendly. The stalls are amazing. Like, there's so much shopping. The shopping was brilliant. And just speaking to the the different kind of people that make the games and seeing all the podcasts owned and everyone that does the podcasts, it was just a really wonderful day. And we can't wait to go back. For when they decide to do it again, because I'm assuming it probably won't be on this year. But well, I hope I hope it will be. I mean, who knows? But uh, it's it's supposed to be late November or very early December. So, so yeah, we don't know. Uh, I'm I'm supposed to have a panel at UK Games Expo, which has been postponed to August. 
Uh, okay. As far as we know, it, uh, uh, Expo is still happening in August, but yeah, to be honest, I'm I'm not, yeah, I'm not I'm not convinced. Uh, uh, yeah. We'll see, but uh, yeah, if we we'll, who knows? Yeah, you you might be right. Maybe in November, December, it won't be happening again. But uh, yeah, we'll see. That would be that would be a big hole in the heart of uh, a lot of tabletop RPG fans. Uh, in the UK, especially I got this year, I, I motivated some French tabletop RPG podcasters and Portuguese uh, designers yeah. to visit us in, in Dragon Meat. So that would be a, a pity if it, if it was cancelled. But yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's hopefully the... it won't be. Yeah, but at the minute we just, I think that's the hardest thing about lockdown is the fact that we can't make any future plans. Because we don't know what it's going to be like in two months' time, or two weeks' time, or three months' time, and there's like, there's events and conferences that I'm dying to go to, and I'm like, will we even be able to go? Will they be running? If they are running, how safe are they going to be? Like, we just, we just don't know. Yeah, it's it's really weird, you know. I mean, that's one thing to know. Okay, you we gonna be in situation X for two months, three months, four months, five months, six months. But it's another to to go in a couple weeks at a time, and at the end of the couple weeks, you've got someone showing up uh, in front of number ten and saying, "And oh, now we are postponing things of three weeks, or or now uh, we're gonna start stopping the lockdown." And but it's gonna be step by step, and we need to be careful because things could happen again, and we'd be in full lockdown yeah. again. And you're, and I mean. I'm not usually very to cut the slack with uh rule, you know leadership rulers but right yeah. now I'm a bit like pff, it's they they're playing it by ear because no one ever faced yeah. that situation in those circumstances No so. we're we're on completely new territory like no one no one in our time has been through this so no one really knows what to do and a lot of people out listening to the science, they're not looking at the history, they're just like going, oh, well, it'll be different. And it's like, well, no. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, just... it's, I mean, uh, yeah, we, we already had the discussion on, on this show, but uh, the, the only thing I can compare it to, so I work in, in transport and uh, urban okay. planning, and you can compare it to some extent to 9-11, and you look at mm -hmm. the few things, but they, they, they're not so minor. And in the grand scheme of things, I mean, 9-11 uh, was a tragedy, but it was. And the other terrorist attacks were, were a tragedy. But in the grand scheme of things, they, they do not compare at all with what's going on right now. But those things still had ongoing consequences on the way we design yeah. space, on the way we board a flight and we get off of a flight and things which we can or cannot do in a certain environment. And now it's like, okay, well, okay, conventions. Let's say, well, there's no lockdown, but there's still no vaccines. Are we, are we gonna be like, I don't know if you've seen the videos of, in, in Israel, the, the still a low um, protests, but people need yeah. to stay apart two meters away from each other. And you got those weird protests, which looks like a, a procession with people far yeah, apart from each other. And and yeah, our convention's gonna look like that. Is it is it, it's already very hard to finance a convention, so so yeah, it's it it's really weird. My job, I have no idea the sort of projects I will be working on, what they're gonna be like when I resume because it's rail station, airport. Uh yeah, I don't know what yeah. what airport's gonna be like when we resume things. It's like is everyone gonna be like tested as you come in and out of the country like are you going to have like the health insurance is that going to go up ridiculously do we have to sign like a certificate of health is everyone going to have to start quarantining themselves there's just there's so many things that that we can't understand and that's I've been thinking a lot about as you've been saying like the, the aftermath of how things are going to change once this all kind of dies down is you know, is everyone going to go back to work? Are people going to start working from home, or what's going to happen with with just like childcare and like teaching and home workers? And are they going to stay at home more? 
it's just so much is up in the air and things that people said, well, we can't do that. You know, we can't ground all flights. We can't do all this. It's like, well, you've done it. So yeah. it'll be interesting to see what happens, especially for like the environmentalist sort of point of view, because everything that they've been trying to fight for has now happened. And everyone's seen like animals kind of roaming the streets and stuff. I've loved watching some of the videos of like goats taking over cafe areas and and things. And it's like, okay, this stuff will happen. So are we going to go back to normal? What's the new normal going to be? It's it's really exciting but terrifying at the same time because it's the it's the unknown, isn't it? It's like what's well, going to happen? Yeah, it's exciting because it's not all. Uh, I mean, besides the the obvious consequences of uh, so many people. Uh, uh, perishing yeah. from that, there they still are things which could be positive coming out of it. I mean, uh, yeah, it, it doesn't reduce the what happened. I, I think it's, yeah, I don't know how to name that in an appropriate way, but yeah, people might work from home more. Uh, again, I work in transport, and that's something we try, we try to encourage, and something like Transport for London is trying to encourage that people don't show up at work every day at the same time in the morning and in the evening, and Create a situation which is impossible to manage. Uh, yeah. So yeah, more people could work from home. Uh, we could be more ecological. We could environmental friendly. We could be. But at the same time, I was reading today in Germany. Uh, it's interesting. It's the pharmaceutical industry in Germany, which is lobbying against the uh, automotive industry because the automotive industry is saying, well, look. Uh, so the the pharmaceutical industry is saying, uh, uh, look all the, the, the money we're going to put into uh, restarting the economy, this should be uh, envir environmentally friendly still, while you've got other industries like the in automotive industries which are saying, well, you see, uh, the situation is very bad, it's very tough, so I think we should forget the environmental targets we set ourselves. Uh, because the priority is to get people back to work and uh, and resume, uh, well, go back to normal. And when we're back to normal, we can again try to be environmentally friendly. And so that that would be that would be a loss. I mean, the, the stuff like here in London, they're trying to improve the air quality. the The objectives will be attained <laughs> this year. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, but uh, but that doesn't mean we need to to get back at yeah doing things terribly yeah. no it's like i i don't want it to go back to normal like i quite like how things are at the minute in a lot of ways obviously not the the illness and the and the sad parts but the people spending more time at home they're spending more time with their families and i think just building up new hobbies people's work-life balance is starting to come into focus i've seen a lot of my friends that just work all the time that are like you know what like, I'm not happy in, like, my job and what I want to do. And they're all kind of, like, reevaluating what they want out of life. And I think it's great to see people focusing on on their mental health more and what's going to make them happy and, you know, making sure they can do their job, but more effective ways of doing their job. And even my partner, I mean, he's he's still working. He's working from home. But just not being in an office every day, not having that commute on the public transport, surrounded by people is just having such a good impact on him. It's like, well, it's great because I go into work, I work, I come home, and like he's he's already here, and he doesn't have to deal with the office stuff. And I remember speaking to Kat about it, and she was like, the most stressful part of her job is the commute. You cut that out for a lot of people, and they work better, they're more effective workers, and it's better for the environment without collapsing the economy. So there's a nice balance there. Yeah, and there's, um, and there's also, I, I find also people tend to oppose things, like they, they oppose reading on a book versus reading on a tablet, or working from home versus working uh, from a, a workplace. Uh, the two things can co a bit. Uh, I mean, my last job before I lost it, I had two days of work from home, so uh, two two weeks which yeah. followed each other's, and it was the first time I was able, allowed to, to work from home and that the resources were there to allow me to, yeah. but... Just having a single day of work from home per week uh, it meant already a lot for for me. So if everyone go back to work, but say to their boss or their boss say, "You know, look, you can work from home one day a week." It's it's already massive in terms of 
uh, yeah, transport environment and well-being and, and all of that. So, and once you've got one there, well, it's more likely you can get a second, maybe. I mean, it's it's a knock-on effect. I mean, that's a fun thing. That's what we do with role-playing and when we read fantasy and science fiction, we try to, to anticipate things, but uh, it's difficult when you're in the middle of the storm to, to try to work out what, what, what is the sun going to look like behind that. It's like, my sister, um, she lives in Switzerland, her and her partner, and they've been working from home for years and they have an office and when they go into the office like no one has like a set desk there's like desk spaces and it's just like first come first serve so you can go in the office if you need to have meetings with people or if you need to use like more secure broadband or anything like that and there's the time you work from home and there's conference calls and and things and they get so much work done but because they're at home they have like a set quota of how much work they have to do and as long as they do it how you do it is up to them so they can have like a four day week if they want to as long as they get all their work done on friday they can have the day off and head up to the mountains and go skiing or snowboarding or mountain biking and i think if you start giving people that more freedom there's a lot of people that will put the effort in there's always the few that will kind of be lazy and they won't meet targets but those people aren't going to do it whether they're working from home or working in the office like it's a set mind and it, and it opens works really well over there. It opens options. I mean, for the employer, that means they don't need such a huge office space for to host everyone. They, they can have a space which yeah. is a half, a third, or even smaller than what they usually do. And I mean, renting an office exactly. space, that's a lot of money. And then uh, that means people can live and work in other places. I mean, I just got contacted by a recruiter about a job in High Barnet, which is still in London, but I, I was checking the commute mm -hmm. from the nursery in the morning. It's uh, yeah. more, it's like 80 minutes, 90 minutes from from the nursery, despite being in London and going through the, the worst yeah. places and worst line to get there. And I told them, yeah, I could do it once per week and the rest working from home. So that's, that's mm -hmm. the situation from my point of view. From the point of view of the, of the council, was the, the person recruiting, that means that they could hire a broad spectrum of individuals. They don't need individuals who are within reach. You could take individuals who live wherever. And if they live wherever, yeah. maybe they're in place which is less expensive to live in. So so maybe they don't have to pay them as much uh, as they would pay me because I'm in the center of London. So I've got, I got yeah, financial needs well, and therefore I got expectations yeah. when I'm hired. So yeah, it, it opens possibilities for, for a lot of people. Yeah, and there's so many people that can't get to workplaces for you know various different reasons, and there's like a whole new options available to them now. Going well, actually, we can work from home, yeah. and you know, parents and things where like yourself, when you're stuck around childcare, you you have to bear in mind you commute, and what happens if if the tube's late or if a train breaks down or your car fails? So being able to work from home and be able to like adapt it all around because I've I'm self-employed so I've been working from home I mean like flexible for years and it I couldn't imagine being stuck in an environment where I had to kind of be somewhere at a set time every day because I just can't work to that kind of time scale but I can get the work done if it's up to me and I've got my own flexibility to do it so I much prefer the freelance way that I work and there's so many other people that would benefit from that style of work because they can't work the nine to five stuff for physical or mental health reasons, but they can still do the job that's required of them. They just can't do it in an office environment in this location. There's also an interesting, uh, you know, to what point it can also influence this nine to five mindset, because I, I've been a freelancer. It's not exactly what I'd like to go back to, uh, yeah. but at the same time, I find it very annoying when you, you go to the office and the 9 to 5 is not only what... People expect you to be around a lot and what they, they look at or even people the way they look at themselves. It's not just employers versus employees. I see that a lot with employees, even younger ones. They, they feel like they, they have to to stay late and so on and they, they're super inefficient. <laughs> Yeah. But they, they they arrive early and they stay late, and everybody's like, oh, they they're working hard because they stay late. And 
me um, when I need to work with some of them I'm like they, they're mainly very inefficient in what they do uh, one, one of the first thing I do when I've got a junior working for me in, in those environments is to say I don't care I don't want you to work quotation mark hard and stay till seven in the evening to do one yeah. thing what I need you to do is to be gone at, f at 5.30 but I need something done by 5.30 because I prefer something done on time than mm -hmm. having something which you they, they spend doing things. They did not think what was essential in the task I asked them to and they, they start yeah, doing things which are, are, are not required. What, they, they don't really think about the, the question which is asked to them and then it's 5.30 and they oh yeah, I'm going to stay late to finish and you're like I don't care. I'm I'm going me now. So if you stay here, uh, you haven't given me the thing I needed to send by the end of the day, or that I want to send early morning tomorrow. I'm not here to to check on it. Or are you feeling making me feel guilty through peer pressure or the, of leaving you here? Uh, I don't care about that. <laughs> Just try to to focus on the t be time efficient and self considerate. People are not always considerate towards themselves i don't, i'm not sure it's the right term yeah no I, I i get it completely and there's like this whole thing about like the longer you work and the harder you work like that means that's the definition of successful and i'm like well no it's it's like work hard play hard like you know work smarter not harder like fit it all into smaller bits of time i call that Rather being the right to stay like I call that being the right kind of lazy, because it, it took yeah. a it took a lazy person to invent the wheel and the cartwheel. And yeah, I see so, and I see so many people when I compare that to their use of softwares or any tools, they are like, I don't want to learn to use a cartwheel. It's and and they just carry their bag of rocks <laughs> rather than just invest the time in learning the wheel and the cartwheel and then you it's going to be so much easier you will be yeah. able to be lazier by using a cartwheel but they oh, just don't there, cause I'm a very lazy person and I'll look at things and I'll be like okay what's the easiest way for me to to get this done it means that I have to knuckle down and work my ass off for like this amount of time so I can create something that is a nice and streamlined like I will do that because it's it's better in the long run rather than just slugging away at something for ages because I can't be bothered to learn. I'm like, actually, it's worth my time to learn that and then I can just sit back and it can do the thing on its own. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, how do we bring back the conversation to gaming? It's a yeah, it's like we're going a bit <laughs> off topic from global well, topic, aren't we? It's been on... Well, we've been off topic quite a bit in Café Rollis lately, so it was the case with Cat also, but... <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. I guess you were already playing with people from around the world. You you play with Anno from Anova, uh, am I right? I have played with um, with Hannah. Well, I haven't played with him yet. I'm dying to. Um, I've met Hannah at Dragon Meet, and I've kind of we've spoken on and off. And I really, really want to to be a player in one of his games. Um, so Hannah, if you're watching, like <laughs> I've got lots of spare time. <laughs> Hit me up. Well, yeah. Um, oh. but I've been playing like role play games for years, like absolute years. Like I remember back in high school when it was like properly like a nerdy thing to to do, and we had like our own little little cult thing. You didn't really talk about it because people didn't understand it. And then it's just I love how much it's grown in popularity. Um, you know, and YouTube's helped so much with that. Um, not just with Critical Role, obviously. Um, but like Acquisitions Inc. is is still one of my favorites, and there's just so many different games to play um, that I just I want to play so many different games. And with one of the things that I want to do with DID and D and D is start people off with D and D because it's one of the easier ones to kind of get behind. I but then disagree. like do like a little mini campaign. <laughs> do you know? I, yeah, no, I, I got strong opinions about Dungeons and Dragons, as you can ask uh, Kat. Uh, I don't find it. I have heard this. It's not, I mean, uh, it's not that I dislike, uh, something I repeated a million times. It's not that I dislike Dungeons and Dragons, but uh, the two things are, I, 
Yeah, I think there's really, a, there's no other word than that hegemony of Dungeons and Dragons at the moment. I don't think there's ever been in any other media such a overbearing of a single product over all the others. I, I think, I, I remember I had a, a boss who used to tell me about when the Beatles were, were on, but back in the days that you would hear the Beatles mm-hmm. everywhere all the time and when they yeah. when they split suddenly created that void for for other bands uh, but even though I, people still knew that there was a thing called music <laughs> that has been other musicians beyond before the Beatles and the, even as the Beatles was going on you know the media didn't call music the Beatles <laughs> yeah. or do you know that Beatles can uh, suit your mood uh, in the office space or that it's good for mental health well Dungeons and Dragons is like that do you know that Dungeons and Dragons is good for mental health it is yeah. getting yeah, very it, saturated it's, it's like, I love and... it as a game but there are there are other games out there Yeah. which is what I kind of want to do on the channel is show people that this is us playing D&D this is us playing Vampire the Masquerade this is us playing Mage this is us playing Werewolf this is us going back to like Pathfinder or Starfinder. Let's jump into Tales of the Loop. Let's play a Conan adventure. Let's, you know, pick something randomly that no one's played before, or at least that no one else is doing, because there's so many just things that you can do. And Changeling, um, I really want to play Changeling because I really want to be a Kitsune, because that <laughs> would just be amazing. Um, not that I have a thing about foxes at all. I think yeah. we we're getting there. Uh, do you go? You know, they got Vampire by Night, uh, Shields of Tomorrow. Uh, even Critical yeah. Role is playing more and more other games, so so people are slowly starting yeah. to get aware. But yeah, when I mean, yeah. I I a bit less those last couple of weeks, but I've been on TikTok, and it's it, and it's D&D. I love TikTok, but, but when it's D and D, just D&D, insane, D&D. isn't it? On TikTok, it's like everything I'm looking at, it's and there's it's all the tropes and things that I'm getting really annoyed at it's like if I see one more bar seducing a dragon I think I'll throw my phone out the window like <laughs> I'm just like there are better ways to play a bard um I mean in our campaign that we're doing like Luna's like a half unicorn bard she won't be seducing anyone and it's just it's I get so annoyed with how many it's great that people are coming into the community and that's wonderful but don't just stay at D&D because there's, you know, have a play with Pathfinder if you want something that's similar to D&D because you can modify so much in Pathfinder. I love the modifications. It's like picking them out of thin air. Um, or Dark Heresy if you want to go for something like nice and... I Friend- love with Dark Heresy. <laughs> Friendly. I, I love Dark Heresy. <laughs> n- n- nice <laughs> and least... cheery. Yeah, go nice and cheery, then switch to Dark Heresy and welcome to a world of war. <laughs> where when you roll you know exactly where you've hit it's like i've got their right arm or i've got their left leg or i've got a headshot like i love that kind of the mechanics in that where you actually know exactly where you've hit and it's taken out of your control the dice choose for you um yeah and pl- that you will just die <laughs> i played a bit of dakar resi that, 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 was, that was nice it's a interesting universe uh. it's a very fascinating i mean i would I've been playing, I remember playing my first game of Warhammer 40k when I was like 15, 16, um, hanging out in the games workshops as the little goth girl that I was, and I had like an entire Turinid army that were like pink and purple with glitter on, because that's how you, that's how you paint monsters, right? And then I hadn't played for ages, and my partner is really into his 40k, and his friends all kind of play in like tournaments and stuff, and so now I'm like delving back into the world of 40k. I resisted purchasing an army because once you start, you just can't stop with that stuff. You just start collecting more and more and you then just get obsessed with painting. And mini painting is just a money leeching thing just as it is. <laughs> You're like, oh, I want to paint this one and that one and this one. And... But at least you got the role playing but... games now. So you, you can delve into the world. I don't know if they ever. Yeah. There's probably adventures using. I mean, that's why I'm a uh, fantasy. But uh, the uh, it was not even the miniature. I played it online. I remember a game of Blood Bowl. You could play, and you would play <gasps> one character by by this old web browser thing, and you would play the action of your single character. And you were there was a championship. Uh, there, there was a fashion for that uh, at yeah. the moment. I, but I haven't heard yeah. of Blood Bowl adventures. Would be fun to run a mini campaign it would be 
of Blood Bowl. <laughs> it could be a Blood Bowl team. That would be amazing. Um, I love Blood Bowl. Um, because when they re they re released it a couple of years ago as um as a game you can buy rather than the computer game, and my dog's named after the Chaos God of Blood Bowl. Uh, <laughs> so he's called Nuffle because they can't pronounce N- NFL, so they pronounce it Nuffle. So Nuffle is that's why my dog's called Nuffle. It's because of Blood Bowl. Um, but I would love to have her to play in a campaign that was in like the Blood Bowl universe. Um, I find that surprising. That really, really it it doesn't exist actually. It should exist. I mean, that's that's a it thing. Should. Someone needs to homebrew that. Like, <laughs> that'd yeah. be a great thing to homebrew. Oh, that would be cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny. Uh, we were talking about people going back to work and so on. Uh, at the moment, I'm wondering if I'm gonna go back to. I mean, immediately uh, in in a in a short notice to playing around the table because I started a campaign weekly, very sh- somewhat short session, less than three hours, more two hours and a oh, half, wow. but weekly every Monday. And and it's with my very first gaming group uh, from okay. when I was in Belgium. So I haven't played with them in pff, more than a decade, maybe 14 years. And when they started a, a new table, usually they played around the table, and because of the quarantine, quarantine, they they said, "Oh, the game master was like, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna run an online game. If I run an online game, I could invite people I haven't played with in a while because they they don't live uh, in Belgium anymore. So he invited me. So now I play every Monday, and even now when I'm thinking of running a campaign, I'm very tempted to run it online because I." It's not just, I mean, it's more convenient. You don't have the commute of going to a, to a game. You don't have the noisy environment yeah. where you play a game. You don't have the expenditure because just going to, to I mean, I love Bad Moon Cafe, but it's noisy and just, just buying a few drinks, that's minimum 10 pounds, which just burn in yeah. the air uh, for nothing of high value, really, uh, of yeah. a price pizza and so on. So yep. yeah, I think I could stick to online gaming for for a little while. It's fun. I mean, I don't think anything's going to take away tabletop because there's nothing better than kind of just being at the table around but your friends. Again, it's not replacing. But online gaming is it's really fun. I think people don't appreciate it as much as you do, and until you do it, you're like, actually, this this is fun, and you can still see things, and there's loads of different apps and things you can use to to help make the experience better. And yeah, I'd look forward to seeing some of your games online. I think I'd Please like... share them. Please stream them. <laughs> I think I'd like to start a new campaign with, I don't know, with new players or maybe not new players, but players who never played together. You know, I I like mm-hmm. I like to to cast my player. I, I, it's actually something I haven't heard about uh, about much in you know the the podcast and so on, uh, advising about you. It's often stories of people who happen to be in the they have a group and they have a game master and all the advice is about the game master and the group to get along together and there's very few mm-hmm. advice of discussion or discussion revolving around how do you choose one another or how do you yeah. as player rather than treat it like oh you happen to live in uh, I don't know that town somewhere you are the players in that town and there's a game master in that town and you're stuck with each other's and there's no option, yeah. and you need to get along. There's very few discussion about, actually, I'm playing this Warhammer 40k this week, so it would be great to have Danny at the table, because she's a big fan, and I want to run the, that campaign. And the next campaign is like, I'm playing something completely different, so I won't be inviting da- Danny for this one. Not because I don't like Danny, but because for this one, I want to play with other people. You know, the curation yeah, of it's... things. I think it's great for that because you can then go, actually, I know this person really enjoys this particular fandom or these kind of things. Let's bring them into a game like this and see how, because having different people in your games is great and everyone's kind of been at the table where you don't always get on with everyone you're playing with or you don't particularly like the style that someone role plays, but you can't change it because you're stuck in that in that group. You know, There's not a lot of other people you can do. So when you're playing online, you get that choice of going actually let's let's see if i can find some more people that want to run a campaign that is like this and let's run one like this but it'd be nice to see the as i said like the background 
interplay of the people and you know if they actually get on and how they choose and if you could be a gm and go okay i want to run this campaign i need a someone that is going to be like this and fill this criteria and have like a nice cast list and go okay actually these i want these people in a campaign because they'd be really they'd either gel well together or they'd be very conflicting and see how you how you do run in the same campaign with different people yeah what well, rather than cope with whoever you have uh you you pick people to have very different experiences across table but this this kind of a taboo of it, it at the moment i feel like culturally in the community it's a bit like oh you did not invite me for your next game that means that you don't like me anymore it, it's not this yeah. I, I think it's, it's like, just don't take it personally like yeah but, but I think it's a question of scarcity of games, you know, it, it's it's kind of a sinful circles because people tend to stick with one another. There's not a lot of movement between groups and tables. Yeah. Groups tend to, to stick with one another. I don't know, maybe playing online could change that because again, suddenly... Hopefully it will. I really hope that it will bring the community more close together and you see different pe people kind of mixing in and either bringing new characters to a different table or even like cross campaigning and like someone gets zapped out of their world in one campaign over something and then boom they're in someone else's campaign playing the same character and you get to follow their journey i would love to see campaigns start to mix between each other more with the same characters so you see the characters that you love and you you enjoy going into different campaigns and it's like oh my gosh like i wasn't expecting that person to show up in this world and yet here they are and it it'll be a nice thing for the viewers to watch because you then get a nice cross mix of viewers so it's a win-win for everyone but people just seem very scared to open up themselves to that kind of situation which is a shame so hopefully people will get past that now everyone's stuck inside and losing their minds to not take things personally and actually go you know what i want to bring this character to your campaign and let's do it and get in there so does that mean if you go back in the high level entertainment in dungeons and dragons that you would dream to have a uh, Jim Dark Magic uh, hang out with the Mighty Nine and having uh, for the uh, land in the world of Acquisition Incorporated. Could you imagine Jim Dark Magic and Jester? Oof. Like, Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> that would just be brilliant. I would. I really want to see Jim Dark Magic and Jester do a campaign, but it'd be wonderful because they already do it a little bit with, with like the. Um, Oh, the Acquisitions Inc. team, you know, like the C team and stuff, they have their characters mixing through and like Strix has come into play on a few others and so it'd be nice for them to actually jump into a Critical Role campaign or any of the others that are going on and suddenly, you know, Vexalia appears in something and starts like taking on things or helping them with a campaign and then Jester comes somewhere and then not and it'd be nice to see these characters all intermingle with each other I, I'd love them. I'd love it to happen, but it probably won't. <laughs> well, you never know. You never know. I mean, yeah. Apparently, they, they're still not. They haven't resumed their gaming, so they they're refraining from trying to have sessions online separately from one another at Critical Role. But mm. once people start, that that's when suddenly you you've got the the options. So, yeah. Who knows? I mean, if if people are asking for it, that that might happen. I haven't. Yeah. Uh, Acquisition Incorporated was. One of the very first actual player was exposed to, and I did listen. And at the beginning, there were small arcs, so it was quite nice. But I think the latest episode I listened to, and it means it, it dates back, uh, um, Will Witten was still in there, so it was with uh, uh, Aeophil. So I remember <laughs> fondly of him uh, being thrown in a acid pit. <laughs> that was yep. quite cool. Did, did His you... roles were just legendary, and because <laughs> acquisitions like yourself was one of the first ones that I started to to listen to, and I followed it pretty much up until until now. I've I think I'm missing four about four episodes behind. I need to catch up on, but I've loved watching it go through. And when Chris Perkins left and Jeremy Crawford took over, I was like, oh, no. I'm not going to enjoy this at all. And then I'm like, oh, actually, Jeremy, you, you're doing well here. <laughs> it surprised me because you get so attached to a particular DM 
and to have someone else come in and DM the group that you love so much. I was very kind of conflicted about that. And I didn't watch Alcohol Station Inc. for about a year because I was like, no, I, I like Chris Perkins as a DM. I don't want to watch someone else. But then I'm like, well, you know, Jeremy is kind of the rules designer, so let's let's give him a go. And oh my god, like, what was it? I, I'd love. Hmm? Was it Chris Perkins who showed up? Well, he probably did that several times, but it's it's one of the the performance in a game I found the most amazing. Uh, I think it was Chris Perkins who who played a game uh, with uh, the Mighty Nine with Critical Role, and he played a a kobold. Uh, was it Plurg? And it, 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 it had... was um, it was the sprite, the little um, splurg thing, and he's like, he lived for like eleven days, and like, yes. he, oh, and he, he, he is just, I, <laughs> I love him as a, as a DM. I love when you watch him play a game, like, oh, it's so much fun, and I think it really interesting to watch the games that Chris Perkins is a player on, because you see the DMs start to get a little bit like. Oh god, like he knows all the rules and stuff and they, they get a little bit wary, but he just he plays so nicely, he's such a nice player and he won't argue like the the DM. It's like he just goes with whatever the DM says at the time. But his role play ability is wonderful and he's so funny and that little character that just arrived and died and oh it was just brilliant. Yeah, I just love that character um, because his performance was one hundred person from the from yeah. the start and yeah the Quickly, this idea of uh, oh, so how long do Cobble live? Eleven days. <laughs> and old are you? Days. Eleven days. Eleven <laughs> and, <you're>... days. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's this situation. I don't want to spoil it. And there's cartoons of it, so so people can can Google it. Uh, I think yeah. it's Splurg, uh, Chris Perkins. And yeah, when, when but when the character dies, <laughs> it happens quite fast. And, but it really feels like. I was just like. The player is like, yeah, you know what? This character is supposed to to come and go very fast. Yes. And it did because you got so attached to this character so quickly, and then when it <laughs> happened, everyone was like, <laughs> it just like that quickly. Because <laughs> we're we're really watching a couple of campaigns at the minute, so my so it's we're not that far off that episode, and I'm so looking forward to it, just to just to see Chris Perkins play because. I just I love that Spurring little character. He just uh, he he was just fantastic to get so attached to a character so quickly. <laughs> it's just it's a credit to how well he role plays. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. There, there's so many cartoons made out of that, but yeah, it it's magical. And I I didn't see a lot of Critical Role games, but this one is engraved in my head uh, immediately. I think uh, yeah, well, I was probably crying when. Of tears of of laughter when when oh, that laughter, was. Oh, laughter, absolutely. So, uh, yep. Yeah, sorry. No, no, go. go. Okay. <laughs> uh, I was about to say it's uh, it's gonna be about time for me to wake up my son from his daily nap so he goes to bed <laughs> at the appropriate time in the evening. Uh, thank you yeah. so much for joining us, Danny. Do you have anything else you want to discuss? Plug and uh, either way, uh, tell people where they can find you if you wish to be found. Yeah, I mean, if you if you want to come and find out more about me and what it's like to live with multiple personalities, if you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, everything Geek Dogs and D and D, D I D even. Um, myself and Cat Tulip do a regular show where we're making um, basic D and D characters out of my alters to give you an idea as to the kind of full rounded people that they are and how different everyone is. So come along and. And come and talk to us if you want to know anything about what it's like to live with it. I am an open book as far as that's concerned. I'm quite happy to talk about it. And we want to have a nice, safe place where everyone can just accept each other for who they are, like regardless of where you are in the world, what conditions you live with, race, religion, we don't care. If you're a nice person, you're in. If you're a nasty person, you're blocked. <laughs> that's kind of how it goes. Simple. Yeah, uh, yeah so yeah, uh, I'm about to... So hopefully tonight... Uh, if I manage before in the middle of the game, ooh, the ice cream truck is in the street. Ice cream man. <laughs> Probably gonna wake up my son. Uh, I should release the final part of my actual play of Dungeons and Dragons. You see, I can enjoy Dungeons and Dragons, which are recorded with London RPG community. Uh, of course, I'm tooting my own horn. 
uh, and the horn of the the game master and the and the, the the magnificent players. But yeah, I don't want to spoil it. But there's something special going on in towards the end of of this episode. So I really really recommend to people to to binge the three previous episodes and then to check this fourth episode because. Yeah, uh, again, that. tooting, toot, toot, my old on. There's something in that episode that you don't hear often in an actual play. I don't actually recall hearing it in an actual play. It should have happened elsewhere, Ooh. but yeah. So go check our adventures in Cantus. Uh, they are quite good, and it, they, they cl we're closing that chapter. So you got a full little arc in four episodes for you waiting there. It's cool. Oh, yeah, I don't remember. It's cool. Uh, Cantus uh, with London RPG community. Anyway, thank you so much, That's Danny. So uh, hope to run thank into you, so you again. Thank you so much for inviting me. Well, it's a pleasure. It's been it's been great. It's great to have those conversation. You know, uh, a positive coming out of a negative. Uh, yeah, I'm having conversation with a lot of awesome people, including yourself. So that was great. Thank you so thank much. You. Bye, everyone. Bye. Ooh.